So this presentation is uh, present is um, try to identify different um, problems we can have with uh, CPU idle and uh, and how we can improve the prediction of CPU idle thanks to the scheduler, the information the scheduler can provide us. So what what's going what's going wrong with CPU idle? Actually, it's it's not so bad, but Today, different platforms, not only Intel, has been ported for CPU idle. And so the governor we have inside CPU idle does not take care of this difference with, uh, with Intel. And the hardware evolved, but CPU idle did not change at all, except adding new f functionality, for example, like the couple C state. But internally, it's just the same. So we try to identify where, where CPU idle fail and how we can fix it. The, we will focus on the menu governor because the later governor is not really, does not really fit in this conf conference because it's for, um, for tick, uh, a periodic tick system and we are more focused on tickless system because we want to do power management and so the menu governor is the governor used with the tickless system. The tickless system has used mainly free information which is the next timer event. This information is related to the current CPU entering idle. There is some statistics about the events occurring on the system so we are trying to then to do some statistics on the on what is happening on the CPU and predict what could be the next event. And then we have a performance multiplier, which is supposed to prevent the system to go to a deeper idle state if we are using intensively the, C the CPU. So the next timer event could be just improved because today we are but just a question of code is we are um, writing the length of the of the um, sleep time, but actually we still running, we're still running until we will read again this information so the time elapsed and maybe it's not uh, this information precise enough for uh, entering uh, the the idle states. So the problem we have is the next timer should be I think Tuka did uh, uh, later in the presentation. He did uh, some some plotting with what is predicted and what we have. So, actually, with the with the Intel platform, uh, the different idle states are um, handled by the firmware, and it's like a black box, and we don't see we don't see what what's happening behind this black box. Dog. So, in inside CPU idle, we don't care about what is happening in the different PM uh, um, blocks inside the hardware. But on Intel, it's totally different because we have to handle from the CPU idle back the driver the different dependency with the peripherals and shut them uh, down in case uh, we are reaching a deep idle state. So <coughs> what we are seeing with the timer is as it's per CPU, uh, if we have two cores entering which will enter the deep idle state, one timer for one CPU 
will make the CPI, the CPI idle menu governor to enter a deep idle state, but the backend driver will wait for the other CPU to enter to the same deep idle state in order to effectively power down the system. And the problem is both are not correlated. The other CPU can enter much more later, later in the deep idle state. So the target residency actually is not, um, is not what is, was expected for the first CPU when he, he tried to enter the, this deep idle state. I will show with that with a small diagram. So let's imagine we have the CPU idle framework. We have the TIC system, the CPU idle um, backend driver, so taking care of synchronizing, synchronize the CPUs in order to enter the deep idle state. The CPU one goes to idle. The CPU framework will look at what is the next uh, timer event. The TIC system say, okay, the next timer is in T1. So the CPU idle will use uh, this information to choose a deep idle state. But actually, the backend driver won't go to th this deep idle state. We just put the CPU in WFI and wait for other, the other CPU to enter the same idle state in order to power down the entire cluster. So now we have the CPU one, uh, CPU zero going to idle, doing the same lookup. It choose the same idle state, and then the backend driver will shut down CPU zero, and through the PMU that will shut down the entire the entire um, cluster. Unfortunately, right after we have a timer which expires for CPU one waking up the entire cluster, and then the target residency which was expected for this state is not effectively what, what we had in reality. So this is what, what's happening here. So we have CP1 entering a deep idle state. The backend driver prevent it to enter effectively to, to this deep idle state and put it in an intermediate state, which is the WFI. And then when the other CPU enters CP idle in the same deep idle state, it will then power down the cluster. So we see that uh, we have the real target residency, which is smaller one than the target, um, the idle state target residency uh, put in the driver. So the information we had when we entered is expected target residency is longer than the idle state target residency, but actually the real target residency is smaller than what is expected. So that can be, uh, it's not, finally it was not worth to enter to this state because for all, all the, 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 system, the hardware we have, if we go to a deep idle state and we exit immediately right after, we consume more power than uh, just waiting in WFI. So how can we prevent this, um, this problem, this issue? is we should have a next event for the cluster. So the CPU idle can, can have the minimal uh, between the next event for each CPU. And we should have the same for the system, saying if we have different cluster, we can do the same for the minimal for each cluster. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So here, how, how from the, the CPU idle framework, we will choose the right, um, the, the right information. Is the CPU, shall we use the timer CPU? Shall we use the cluster CPU? Shall we use system CPU? So in order to choose the right one, we need some topology information. And right before, Vincent uh, did the presentation and showed that with the small task packing, we, are, we introduce a flag, which is the chair power domain. And also with the DT, we have some information about the, the CPU, if they can be powered down independently or not. And with this information, we can provide that to the, 
many governor, so he can take care of uh, many governor, whatever another governor, but he can take care of uh, of the right information uh, instead of using per CPU. So maybe it could be tricky to have an implementation which is lockless and um, and um, how to say uh, create this common information between CPU can be a bit tricky but it's just coding, coding thinking we have uh, the, um, in the free the free information principal information we have in the menu governor we have the performance multiplier so um, the performance multiplier is a factor uh, applied to the exit latency of the each idle state and um, the meaning of this performance multiplier is the more the CPU is used, the less we go to a deep idle state. So the um, formula is uh, two times the load average plus 10 times the NRU. And why two, one, why 10? Actually, it's because it's done by experience, by empirics, so by testing. And that was made on a specific platform and uh, maybe that cannot fit the other platforms with different, different behavior, with different architecture. So I think we can summarize, we can give an another meaning with the performance multiplier which is the more the CPU is used the more we use shallow idle states. So how can we do, provide something similar on the performance multiplier? How can we have this, um, this information? The, the question we have to answer is, what about when, now we are idle, okay. But before, were we idle and after? How will be um, how will be the, the um, busy the system? So the idea is maybe is to try to replace this latency, the latency requirement we have, with some information from the scheduler. So the first the first drastic approach we can tune later, try to find the different values. It's just say, okay, we have the, the system is not uh, heavily used. So we can use uh, an infinite latency. That means we don't care about the exit latency. And that does not enter in the computation of the idle states. And zero latency means we want to go idle. Uh, we don't want to go to any idle states. And because we, are, we want to have uh, as much as possible uh, uh, performances on the system. So we, are, we have some statistics on the scheduler, which is the block load average um, and the load average. So the block lo load average, when the block load average is high and we have the load average high also, we can say we are under heavy load and we can choose latency zero. The same is, uh, happens if we have a load average which is low. That means we are entering, we will enter, um, the load will increase. So we want also resp respons responsiveness. And if the blocked lo load average is low, we can deduce the same. So the load is decreasing or the CPU is mostly idle. Other than that, we have the IOs entering in the formula, in the formula. And the question is, uh, is it really worth to use the number of IOs in the CPU? Um, as we have already some statistics about the interrupts on the system. So maybe this information is already, uh, already taken care of by the statistics. 
I think Tuka will do, will do a presentation right, right after the presentation. Tuka will show that there is uh, effectively no big impact of removing the the NRIO and the performance multiplier in some of the cases. So all these questions are open questions, and the next step now is to code and do some experiments and measurements and. Maybe we, we have to create an, uh, another, another governor because the menu governor is very used on the Intel system and we don't want to break it. So maybe we will create another governor and try to simplify the governor and use more information coming from the scheduler. And I find that to have a, a, more, um, a more, more stupid governor and rel relying more on the scheduler to, do the, to take the, the decision. I will let Tuka to uh, present the statistics on the CPI. We'll get to the interesting questions that was um, posted earlier. So, French keyboard, scary. Um, yeah, let's go to this slide straight away. So, as we all know, or probably we all know, the menu governor that is choosing basically the state that we will use. Uh, it has basically two parts. First, it will try to predict how long is this idle cycle going to be. And then it just looks at the states exported by the driver. And the deepest state that um, fulfills these conditions, there's actually like four conditions really, but these are the main ones, is that um, we have to have a predictive length that is longer than the so-called target, um, target residency. And that is the break-even point when that state becomes more efficient than the previous less deep state. And then there's this, uh, if there's a QoS limit, we want to observe that and uh, stay uh, in a state that has a exit latency lower than that. But anyway, the point is that uh, prediction quality is the major defining factor in how good a job a uh, menu governor does. And there was earlier this question of how well does it work, and I have some measurements. Um, this diagram, I'm sorry, it's lacking the labels on the axis. So the horizontal axis is how long was our prediction for each uh, sleep cycle, it's in microseconds. So we have a um, range of zero to 50 milliseconds. And the uh, vertical axis is how long the sleep actually was. How, how long did we spend in the state? And um, there was this question of how good is the prediction when we are using the factor system of taking the timer and then multiplying it with the factor. and um, the optimal case would be, of course, that uh, our prediction and the reality would form a line going straight through this diagram. But here we see this sort of a shadow to the left of that um, virtual line. And that is when the uh, multiplier was too low. And um, over iterations, our multiplier is slowly rising and reaching to the correct value. But um, for example, in this case, the prediction is not accurate in the sense that very often the multiplier is way too low. And uh, we tend to underestimate the sleep duration. On the other hand, near to the bottom, we have uh, predictions that are rather long, like 20 milliseconds, and the actual sleep was less than one. Yes. Um, this is a 64-bit x86. 
But then, the performance multiplier, and then there's this, um, these multipliers that we use to scale the next timer information. Those depend on the NR IO weight, which means that how many uh, processes are blocked waiting for um, disk IO, file system input or block device input. And um, it's supposed to fix this problem. And when we have some other kind of IO, in, um, in this case, network IO, so if we run a git clone and start downloading the latest Linux kernel, our predictions are really, really bad. So as you can see, instead of having this diagonal line that we would be following, or at least trying to get close to it, we end up making very long predictions, which end up having short actual sleep. And then on the, near the horizontal, uh, vertical axis, we make very short predictions. And like you can see, we pretty often predict that it's about two or three milliseconds and end up sleeping 40 milliseconds. So uh, at least in case of um, cloning your Git repository or watching a video stream, you are actually not performing very well. And um, some of this could be helped if we um, did this statistics gathering in a slightly different way and worked together with um, scheduler. Because when we wake up, we can always take a look at the run queue to see which process actually caused this wake up and uh, based our statistics a bit on that. Sorry? Yeah, sorry, they are missing. So the horizontal axis is how long was the prediction that the menu government menu governor made, how long would the sleep be? And the vertical axis is how long was the sleep in reality? I can give you a certain answer, but um, well, there's this one case where if we do DD, this is just reading um, from disk. This is not very interesting itself, but we, we can at least see that it's probably not disk I.O. because on that system disk I.O. is much faster. So if you are referring to, I think they are visible here, like this group at uh, 30 millisecond and then there's another at 25 or so and one at five. Um, I didn't have time to look up what they really bear. But um, it's, it's something that I'm going to look into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 possible, and also there's this uh, related problem uh, with CPU idle, is that when it's updating these statistics of um, what was the correspondence between uh, the timer value and the real sleep duration, um, we try to measure how long we, the real idle was, but um, then because we are really interested in the event that caused the wake up, not that when we actually can run code. We deduct the uh, latency. But let's say that we want it to go to some really, really deep um, C state that has a very long latency for wake up. And in reality, the hardware went into a shallow state that has almost instant exit latency. 
um, then you are still subtracting from the measurement the very long exit latency and your results get skewed by that. Sorry? Yeah, but it's, you can't really work around it unless you have hardware, some performance counter that you could use to get the real duration. Or if, if you could find out what was the actual state that you were exiting from, that's another possibility. Um, what else? Yeah, this. Daniel covered this cluster business pretty well. And um, this, this ties to what Miasen was doing. So the scheduler currently doesn't get this information what the uh, CPU state is. But uh, CPU idle, because it has the statistics, currently it has the statistics, of, for example, uh, which CPU is most likely, which core is most likely to wake up. And if we want to pick a core where to put the process, if we migrate it or create a new process, we should pick a core that is more likely to wake up or at least is closer to C0. Yeah. So, uh, as was already mentioned in the passing sentence, um, I think we should probably, when we start experimenting with this, uh, make a new governor. And for that purpose, because menu governor has uh, some bits that are useful, like if we have a good prediction, we already have existing code that can choose the C state. So, perhaps we should take these bits that are useful in uh, menu governor and move them as into a separate file and make menu governor call them there. So we can retain the exact functionality of current menu governor and then we can do this experiment. I think it's a um, rather good idea that um, this prediction wouldn't be made in CPU idle at all and we would rather get this maybe from scheduler to idle task or some other place that has access to more information, such, such as the run queue and so forth. Because we could, of course, go and dig into these data structures from uh, CPU idle governor, but then if something changes in the scheduler, we would have to go and change things. So we would be creating sort of unwanted dependency, whereas the information of how, how long sleep are we expecting, that is very unlikely to change. So we could create that kind of dependency instead. It would be better in my opinion. So do we have any questions or is everybody waiting for a break? Currently, there is no way to influence uh, the menu governor at all, in a sense that menu governor only takes four things. It goes and checks the next event, or next timer event, when it's going to be. Then it checks the load average. Then it checks how many tasks are blocking on uh, IO and what was the fourth one. Oh, yeah, the QoS limit. So there is no way to push any information inside. It will only go and get these four items do some calculations and so if we are talking about the current um, menu governor there's no way even if if some driver knew that there will be interrupt exactly at some moment it can't tell it in any way
Yeah, that's that sounds very interesting. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to look it up. I guess you are referring to most likely this one, for example. Yeah, so of course the most critical areas are like the further you get away from the optimal line and depending on your hardware it might be that actually anything past this point is irrelevant because your deepest, if your um, target residency for something is the deepest state is 10 milliseconds then it doesn't matter. I can't give you a number because I haven't used amp meter to, to yeah, such a measurement. But in, 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 in reality, um, most of the action is in this bottom left corner. And um, we would have to zoom in to see. If, if I tried to make a 3D rendering of this because it would have been much more informative. But it's very hard to make a slide that, uh, you know, is easily recognizable, but there's, there's a huge spike in this diagram, for example, there's a huge spike in, in the bottom left, but then there really are ridges that are following both axes. So in this case, I think we could actually measure the, um, well, compared to the optimal behavior. Of course, it's, it's not guaranteed that anyone can ever make optimal um, solution, but maybe a little bit. Um, at this point, we don't have a measurement later. Hopefully, we do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So um, there's a video playback. I don't have. Uh, slide for that, but it's somewhat similar. Okay. So uh, here part of the issue is that it's not only one process. You know, when, when you um, do this in your X term, so you get a network packet, then you print some diagnostic information which goes to your terminal process, which sends it to your X server and so forth. And then maybe your accelerator does something, so CPU is idle and that's part of, part of the problem that you don't have just one process usually. You have a number of processes that um, there's a sequence of events that gets repeating, repeated.